original idea of a map was someone told me about Finhorn Spiritual Community back in Norwich. I got a map in exchange for some dusting at Waterstones before they went bust. Yeah, um, yeah, a really lovely lady at Waterstones allowed me to dust in exchange for a map. And then um, Finhorn was the first place written on it. As I was travelling up towards Finhorn, meeting lots of different people along the route, there was um, showing people where I was going to. So it was the first question everyone asks, where are you going? And it starts the conversation rolling. And um, yeah, hey, here you go, Finhorn. And they go, oh, so you'll go past here. So they circle something, write something else, somewhere else to go. I'm like, okay, this is brilliant. And challenges started, there was all, all manner of wonderful, wonderful things to do and places to see and just beautiful, beautiful stuff. The only idea I had was someone mentioned to me when I first started, because I had no real intention of leaving the south, and uh, someone said about Finhorn on the north coast of Scotland. I was like, oh, wow, never really been north. I should probably should do that. That sounds really good. And uh, as, as I was going up, trying to explain to people where Finhorn was, I'd show them the map and slowly they started writing on it. And you know, once one person has an idea, everyone else sort of follows suit quite quickly. Hundreds and hundreds of people have written on the map now. So getting quite full. There was, I did, <laughs> I put pictures of the map up on, uh, on my blog a couple of a couple of weeks back now and every now and again when I I go to update the blog and I see the old pictures I'm just like wow that map's empty compared to how it is now but all my more detailed movements from A to B like short term are all done through my phone which is which was donated to me by my friend and I get internet off of T-Mobile six months at a time which is very kind of T-Mobile I was until very very recently using um, solar panels to charge my phone. I had one big solar panel and three smaller solar panels, which didn't keep up with my phone, but they did an all right job of keeping me in power for a majority of the time, uh, with only needing the occasional charge at a pub or a cafe or something like that. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I, I left them on half a seat in the tent one day and the tent got raided by what I assume was somebody looking for stuff. And uh, yeah, they had all of my electrical equipment out of it. So I lost all of my solar panels and that sort of jazz. But you know, none of the stuff that I consider valuable was taken. None, none of my paperwork was damaged even. So that was lucky. Is there anything um, all of the people that I meet along the way are just fantastic. I mean, that, there hasn't been an exception. There's, if people want to talk, then they'll talk. There's so many people that are happy to talk and love to talk and <laughs> just, yeah, just brilliant experiences and stories and people from all over the world and bits of the journey just made so much different. You never know when one conversation is going to completely change your life and just saying hello can do all that in a, a split second. Um, I do have a journal. It started off, I was writing people that I met along the way. Well, I started keeping people's names. They were just, just to remember people. I, want, I didn't want to forget anybody that I met. So, I mean, it started off quite, you can see it's quite dense. It's uh, a lot of names in a very short space, just because all I wanted to do was remember these people. And by, by having their names written down, it would help me to remember these people better. Obviously, it was just a journal to start with, and I was going to just try and keep the names just as names in the back, but it seemed to make more sense to, to, <laughs> to let people just write what they wanted to write. I do not read my journal at all. I, I never, never read back what I've written. I read what other people write all the time, just going through it, because it, it just makes me chuckle. Some of the things that are written, like some of the different languages, are just amazing, the pictures, and just people, <laughs> people's general sort of fun aspects of the world. And, Someone wrote on my map about getting a tattoo in Siam. So when I got to Siam, I tracked down the guy, Biff. It was written on my map. And um, it, says, it says, tattoo with Biff. So I sat, found this guy, Biff, eventually in a tattoo shop. And he said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do your tattoo. I'll do your tattoo. I was like, right. <laughs> okay, and he goes, oh, so what do you want done? I was like, well, I've had this idea for a tattoo for a long time in my head and just haven't got around to getting it done yet. And um, it was the sky at the time of my birth. And I'd spent a lot of time planning it and getting the constellations roughly right and translating it to an inward picture rather than 
because obviously when you've got a sky picture it's a lot different to looking in at it so it took a lot of translating a lot of maths and things to to get it right well the sky printed inwards so it's very distorted very disorganized the planets uh, star signs obviously you've got capricorn and all the various different other ones and they go around the moon the sun jupiter etc 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 they will eventually join up across across my back and come back up to the corner completing the full horizon view of what the sky looked like on my bear yeah i only had the three tattoos i've got uh, the first tattoo i ever got was to symbolize my gothic age gothic age and then the second tattoo i got was to symbolize my geek age i went through an area of being a geek and so tetris sort of style tattoo this one symbolizes my spiritual age my new age of spirituality and love and peace and all that jazz <laughs> about my um, birth chart when I was quite young so I already had my birth chart ready to go all the information you type in your birthday online and you can get all of the information for the position of all the planets and star signs like where everything was at the time of your birth anyway then all I had to do was work out what time I was born and then get once I got Google Sky Map on my phone, I realised that I could transport through time. <laughs> so, I, so I teleported to my time of birth and just printed the sky onto paper in a grid system and then printed that around my body. It's, it's something that I've got to live with forever, so I'd be most annoyed if I found someone else that had exactly the same thing and I'd have to remember that forever that somebody else had the same thing. I don't, I don't carry a passport or any form of ID with me at any time. Um, there is nothing to prove anything about who I am or what I say, who I say I am. I, I don't have any records as far as I know anywhere. <laughs> um, I hope to leave the country, maybe one day. Maybe one day I might leave the country. Um, I don't know how it'll work. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. I've got several years of exploring Britain to go. There's a lot of the UK to see, but Ireland and Wales and the rest of Scotland and all the Midlands and all the cities and villages and every tree. I want to explore every tree. And... Oh, yeah, there, there are there are a lot of ways of sort of uh, dealing with the official side of life and um, the paperwork side of it. Or um, a, a key factor is understanding legal lease or legalese, uh, the law language of the country which is a very, very confusing aspect of the world, which they use words that people think they understand to mean different things to what they think they mean. And so throw them off and trick them into saying things that they shouldn't say or things like that generally. Um, but there's a, there's a clause in the Magna Carta and um, it specifies that you can drop out of the, the legal system of the country and not play a part of the government uh, in a sense that you don't pay taxes, you don't receive benefits, you know, all of that side of it, it remains completely separate from yourself. I mean, again, all that information is freely available on the internet, you can easily look up, they're not allowed to hide it, it's Freedom of Information Acts and all that. Um, TPUC is a very good example. Um, the fact that the government isn't doing their job properly, they aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're, they're screwing people over for no particular reason other than money, which I think is a disgraceful thing to be screwing people over for. For any reason, it's not good enough to be honest, but it's a particularly bad one. Yeah, speaking about the clause in the Magna Carta, it uh, specifies that you can send affidavits saying that you don't want to be a part of it anymore, giving the government uh, so many days to respond and improve the way that the country's being run. And if they fail, then you drop out and no longer take part in any of that, which means you're not, you're not legally a, obliged to support statutes or talk to anybody official or there's so many so many benefits to it I mean there's obviously there's always going to be drawbacks as well things like you don't you're not entitled to any benefits of the United Kingdom corporate side which is the PLC side so none of the trash pickups none of the hospital support none of the I mean the other benefits that they say are so great yeah there was a writer for the Guardian that I think I think it was for a social experiment that he started it but he, he was going to go a year without using money and he found a, a caravan on FreeCycle and put it up on an organic farm, worked on the organic farm in exchange for letting him use the land. Built himself a wood-burning stove out of an old oil drum 
and cut down some trees for wood and stuff and scavenged food from the nearby towns and things. And then um, after a year, he, he found it so enjoyable that that life was so perfect that he just wouldn't, he wouldn't go back. And so to, to my knowledge, he was still going. I mean, it was 18 months when I checked. So and that was just soon after I started, so. I, I hope to be living without the use of money for the rest of my life. I, I really do hope that I will never have to interact with money again. And I hope that eventually money won't even exist to be interacted with. I hope that eventually people will wake up to the fact that it's just, it's just a thing that doesn't actually mean anything. That it's given power by the fact that people believe that it has power. It's, it's a bizarre substance that it's unnecessary. I think if everyone just went out of their way to do whatever they could for everyone around them, then the world would be a utopia that wouldn't need these systems of control. The show that I was watching yesterday night uh, called Crunch, it's about the guy, and he actively encouraged people to shred their money at the end of his show. He gets people up on stage, and there was a guy yesterday that shredded a £10 note. It was, I mean, it gives you this empowering feeling. I mean, I burnt my money when I started, started out. I burnt whatever money I could. So, I mean, uh, well, any money that I had left when I started, it was just a little tiny bonfire. Fantastic, really empowering feeling. You mean nothing to me anymore, fuck you, money. Um, yeah, it's just something really freeing about not caring for it, not showing it that it means anything. Um, too many things are giving far, far too much power. They're just, things don't need power. Like the government, they've got this power because we give it to them. And then most of the time they're not deserving of it. And we still just give them this power constantly. Just, yeah, do what you want, fine, go for it. Destroy our country, fine. I live my life in the way that I think is the best way to live my life. I don't think there's, for me, any other way to do it anymore. It just seems, this seems like the most logical step for me to take. Just to stop using money, show people that it's possible at least. If, even if they don't want to do it, they don't have to. I don't force it on anyone. But. Since I got into Edinburgh, it's been the Edinburgh has been the first time when I haven't carried food with me. There's, uh, throughout my whole journey, I've always had food in my bag. There's always been tinned food or dried food available to me in my bag at all times. But I ran out of gas once I got to Edinburgh. I ran out of gas for my um, little stove thing. So um, there's not a lot of point in me carrying food now that I can't eat on the go. So while I've been in Edinburgh, I've been volunteering places, like at, at the Forest Cafe for, for food and things like that. So. Um, I think there are very, very few necessities to life, to be honest. There's, you need food, you need shelter, you need clothes. Um, but other than that, there isn't really much in the way of needs. I have a, a need constantly for human contact. Um, I need to talk to people. I need to like, be in contact with people. And I get that through the internet, which is <laughs> so, so gratefully supplied by T-Mobile. I need to keep... <laughs> Good old T-Mobile. Um, and yeah, I have a, a bizarre need for, like, being able to touch somebody is, sounds unusual, but it's not something that I've I really thought about before. But when you're traveling quite a lot, you're not with the same stable friends. See, it's, it's a bit weird. You can't just walk up to someone and like give them a hug and Stuff like that, it's, it's a bit strange, but as I've been going, there have been people that have joined me for certain sections of it and things, and I get to know people from time to time, and it does happen, do you know what I mean? It's just not as much as I'd like, but I'd like to have a stable, a stable contact, to be honest. That'd be, that'd be lovely, someone that, someone that could do a big section of it with me, or something like that. I wouldn't go as far as to say there's been any real setbacks at all, really. There's, I mean, everything happens how it's supposed to happen, when it's supposed to happen. It's just, it's just a case of understanding that that's how it's meant to be and just accepting it. I mean, that took a little while to, to get to grips with the difference between wants and needs. Um, I found it, well, I found it a bit peculiar to start with, the fact that I'd been so used to the monetary system, just like everybody else, that when you need something, you tend to just go out and find it and buy it or work out how much it's going to cost, work out a cheaper option, and then work out an even cheaper option, and then get that. And, 
Uh, without using money, it's more a case of you get things when they're supplied to you or when they're available to you. And you don't really have much of a choice in that matter. So I spent a lot of time like trading things for other things and working for people so I could get something to trade for something else. But it all depended on who I was around and where I was and what I was doing at the time. Um, certain things are always freely available, like food and things. Everyone gets so caught up on food, they're just like, well, how do you eat? It's always most people's first question. As soon as I tell them about the lifestyle, it's always, well, how do you eat? How do you do this? How do you, how do you generally live? And it's like, well, food in this country is just being chucked away. Like, you wouldn't believe how much food is chucked away in this country. It's, it truly is disgraceful. If people want to donate to Macmillan, they can freely donate to Macmillan. They don't have to do it through me, they can just donate. It doesn't even have to be Macmillan. You can donate to any charities you want, whenever you want. Um, people don't because they like holding on to money because they think it has some form of power. I started off, when I first started the Just Giving site, it wants you to put down a number for your target. So I put £10. The second I hit £10, I cracked another zero on it. As soon as I got to the £100, I cracked another zero on it. I think I put it up to £10,000 now, though. I can't remember if it's a thousand or ten thousand. But yeah, just as much as people want to donate. I mean, like I said, I just want I just want to show people that they don't they don't need their money, so why why keep hold of it? Just Yeah you know I mean, <laughs> give it to somebody else. Let them worry about the stupid system. I got in touch with Macmillan in Norwich and uh, they were very, very keen for me to start helping them out and they said they hadn't had anybody raise money for them by living without money before so that was an interesting one but the, the lifestyle just sort of demonstrates to people that you don't need you don't need your money to survive so why not give it away <laughs> give it to somebody else that does need it or want it to survive and can't seem to work without it and i mean the macmillan nurses do so much work for so many people I mean, they're, they're crazy people, absolutely crazy, and I've never seen any of them without a smile on their face. So, so I thought it was as good a people as any to, to raise money for. Why not? But basically, my, my aim is to, to try and just convince people to get rid of their money. They don't need it. Get rid of it. Burn it. It doesn't matter. It's, it's irrelevant. So if you want to give it to charity to make yourself feel better, do that. I get bored very easily with having the same the same name all the time, it just crazes me. And so I've always changed my name. Um, this is, I've settled on this one for now. It's uh, going by me. It's, it's been my favorite. Lots of jokes come of it. And uh, it's generally quite fun to be called me. Uh, some people can't accept it. So some people still choose their own name for me, which I don't mind, it's fine. Oh yeah, I'm just like, picking some broad beans. I'm going to take them down to the, the Forest Cafe in Edinburgh City Centre and probably cook them up into a, I don't know, bean salad or I might make them into a soup. I'm going to have some of these and some of the other broad beans. These are green broad beans. These are the other white broad beans. I don't know their actual names. They're just like broad beans to me. But um, yeah, it's probably enough broad beans. I'll just get some of the other ones. Um, I don't really know what else there is. There's loads of edible flowers here as well. They're quite tasty. I should probably mention the fact that this is um, West Craigie Farm. Um, this is Tom's particular project on it. Um, he has his own little thing that he does. I just like the fact that I'm working on a farm. It's just stuff to make really salads with because salads just go through so fast at the cafe. Um, there's always salads being needed and if I sort of, I do my work here, there's no way that I'm going to be able to eat all of this stuff that I take myself. Um, so I take it away, cook it there and let them have the proceeds. I mean, they, they're in need of it. So. It's just my way, my way of doing a good deed for all the good deeds that have been done for me over the, the time that I spend. So it sort of swings and roundabouts, isn't it, really? You, you can't, like, constantly take without giving something back. And so, because that's the way the world falls down and collapses and ends up with everyone being just constantly on the take. And that's not the world I want to be a part of. Um, 
Well, from here I shall go to the Forest Cafe. Um, obviously to cook, cook up some salad, maybe give them a hand if they need to. I said cook up some salad. Well, that, throw some salad together. Um, yeah, see if they need any help. I'm not rotated on, strictly speaking, but there's always work that needs doing, so they might want a hand, you never know. Edible flowers to take with me as well. There's like um, chai flowers, really, really oniony flowers. But if I pick a load of those, if, oh well, I don't know how many there are. If I pick a load of those, then I'll uh, be able to crack them into a nice, nice salad with the beans and things if I make a salad. Trying to find the acre, find out where she is. I met her in Dunbar. And she walked from Dunbar to Edinburgh with me. I just met her by chance. She's happy to be walking the same way. So we just walked together. Amazing. But she went off to Russia a couple of weeks back. This will be the first time she's back in England. She's only up for a week or so. It was the night after I got robbed, she was up for a night and I walked her to the, the airport so she could catch a flight to Russia. Tonight's dinner is an arrange of veg, peas and beans and courgettes and carrots. Courgettes and carrots, <laughs> along with some rice and some curry. Um, well, we found the location very, very, very close to the, uh, West Craigie Farm, which is just up the road uh, in a quarry. Uh, yeah, like most kids, you go for a phase of uh, you wanting to deal with cannabis at least because. It's one of the easiest ways of attaining cannabis, really, is to be selling it. And um, I was selling cannabis and speed for a, about a six months streak. Um, but it was getting to the point where I was just like, so ill, not really progressing my life in any meaningful way. I stopped really I think I was starting to die, to be honest. I got to the point where I really did look like a skeleton. I was, it was starting to get a bit dodgy. I mean, I didn't notice myself because I was always on speed, but every time I saw like, my mum's, uh, my mum or my old friends or anything, it was, they said how ill I looked, how thin. And it was pretty nasty, to be honest. I started thinking about the world again, really, after that. But bottom line is, it was generally a very, very, very bad idea to start dealing in the first place. I ended up with a girl, and she was not the right girl for me at all. Um, um, until I came off, and when I came off, there was that realisation moment. It was just like, what am I doing? Why am I here? What the fuck is this all about? And how would you get into far countries like this? Oh, I'd love to go to other places, you know, but it's something that I'll cross when I get to it. I'll get to other countries if I'm meant to get to other countries. Mm -hmm. Trust in fate. This is beautiful. 
What about marrying? Would you marry? I've never been interested in the idea of marrying. Marrying is a corporate idea. It's designed over ownership. Originally, you'd own your your wife, and uh, that didn't really appeal to me from very early on. But but that's not an issue because I have no interest in having children at the moment with the world in the state that it's in. I'm not sure. I think it's it's a very nice thing, and I think that feelings can be strong enough to to at least believe in it. And that's the important but thing about it. It's only a piece of paper. Maybe you want to promise each other because I don't know. Well, you can do that without the formal marriage, can't you? You could. Marriage is just for government's benefit. It has no relevance on the individuals at all. That's why I don't believe in marriage. I don't know. I just think about it. Everyone should think constantly about everything. And question everything. Edinburgh, right? when, when the festival ends, after all the fireworks have happened, um, I'll be sticking mainly with the plans of the map. The map governs everything. It is a magical map. It is a wonderful map. It tells me where to go. And so I shall pick the next nearest point on the map and go to that. <laughs> and do whatever it says to do there, and then move to the next nearest point. I think for the most part it's going to be sending me around the coast of Scotland, although it does have a lot in the middle of Scotland, for the highlands and whatnot. So I will hopefully get into there and do a lot of the mountains. <laughs> Maybe. I might die. Who can tell? <laughs> <laughs>